wanted to come on here and talk about how to interpret the time we're living in in darkness and pain and trial as a Christian, as a believer. When I look at what's happening in the earth, it's pretty easy to either become sorrowful, disillusioned, or upset and angry, um, or just confused. Because sometimes we think of God as one who's going to come and just make everything right all the time, and, and that walking with him should equal my life is perfect. But that's not really biblical. It's not what's in the word of God. Um, Jesus actually explains right before he's headed to the cross that um, the, the trial and the pain of this earth will be upon us, but that he tells us to take joy because he overcame the world and the things that are in the world that cause pain, like sin and suffering. He's overcome that. Um, he prays to the Father before he goes to the cross. He, he prays for us, not that we would be taken out of the world, um, but that we would be preserved from the, the evil one, from the wicked one, Satan, um, as we live out this era of time in the story of redemption. And he actually told his disciples right before he went to the cross, he says, um, I know sorrow is filling your hearts because I've told you that I'm headed out, I'm leaving. But believe me, it's, it's to your advantage that I leave because when I leave, I'm going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and He's going to fill your hearts. He's going to live inside of you. He's going to remind you of everything that I ever said, and He's going to explain to you the things that are to come. And so now as a church, as a Christian, but also as a, a Christian, as a believer who's attached and knitted into the network of the body of Christ, one bride, the church, um, what is our mandate right now in this hour, and how do we interpret the darkness and the shaking and the pain that comes upon us in things like COVID-19 and shelter in place and the the trials and the, the things that hit not just us as individuals, but the whole planet maybe. Um, how do we manage our faith in this? And so all week, God's been showing me to look at those chapters in John, Jesus headed to the cross. He's preparing his disciples for the age to come, the season that we will be in after he ascends. But then he also explains what it's going to be like in the kingdom of heaven right before he comes back because he says I'm going to come back it's not like I'm going to be gone forever I'm just going to go away for a time and this will give the nations a chance to turn to me because he's asked his father for the nations and um, so in Matthew 25 it's really interesting because Jesus preaches about the kingdom of heaven constantly while he's walking through the earth hundreds and hundreds of times he mentions well at least almost 200 times, I should say, he mentions the kingdom of heaven and he talks about what it's like. Uh, but this is interesting in Matthew 25 because he's saying in that day, in that time before, um, when it's nearing my return, this is what the kingdom of heaven will be like. And so he tells us what it's like now, what it operates like, what it looks like. But then in this part of scripture, he's saying, and when it's time for me to come back, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. And he says in um, chapter 25, he's, he talks about the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, and then the judgment of Gentiles, um, or the judgment of his church, where he's sifting out um, those who love him and those who have um, served, how, how those who love him have served him. And... Um, the cool thing about Matthew 25 when we look at it is that we see Jesus coming as a judge. Um, he's coming to judge his own people. He's coming to judge his church. He's not necessarily talking about the whole earth here. He's saying this is what the kingdom of heaven will be like. And those who are in the kingdom of heaven, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, this is what will happen in sifting and judgment when I return. And his judgment isn't necessarily like him rejecting or condemning, he's already taken condemnation upon himself through the cross. He already took judgment upon himself. He is the light of the world. And he says, when I return, I'm just going to be present and there's going to be light shining and there's going to be an evaluation of how you lived in the kingdom of heaven and how you lived for me. So our salvation is already secure, but 
after that, how did you live it out? And when he returns, that's what's going to be weighed in that moment. Um, and, and the whole kingdom of heaven, this is what's going to be looked at. And so the first one, in chapter 25 of Matthew, he talks about the parable of the ten virgins. And he says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and fell asleep. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of the oil that's in your lamp, for our lamps are about to go out. But the wise answered and said, No, I can't give you my oil, or else there won't be enough for both us and you. But go, rather, to those who sell and buy oil for yourself. And while they went out to buy the oil, the bridegroom came, and those who were already wet, who were ready and waiting went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So here we just see this amazing breakdown of Jesus coming to judge his church as the bridegroom. He's coming as a bridegroom in this part of chapter 25. In the next part where he talks about the talents, he's coming as the king and judge to see how his um, house was managed and how he managed the things that were handed to us. But this is a very, very special one because he's actually coming as a bridegroom to take with him the ones whose hearts are burning and ready, ready for him ready in the darkest hour of the night, in the midnight hour, the church will all fall asleep. The church will get weary. It says all 10 of these brides became weary in the waiting. But the only difference was between the foolish and the wise was that the wise had developed a reservoir of oil that they had purchased over time leading up to that darkest hour. And whatever it was that they were doing to purchase that oil over time, leading up to that darkest hour, had um, a cost. It was something that they invested in, and they purchased over and over over time, and they built up a reservoir and a savings, in a sense, of this oil. What is the oil? The oil is the Holy Spirit. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of love um, that, that lives inside of the heart and keeps... The fire, the first love of Jesus, when we first fell in love with him, it's the Holy Spirit and our relationship with the Holy Spirit that keeps that love alive and burning. And in this chapter, Matthew 25, he says, this is what the kingdom of heaven will be like right before I return. I'm coming back in the midnight hour. It's going to be the darkest time of the universe, of, of the earth. It's going to become dark. Right before that in Matthew 24, he says, before I come back, it's going to be like the days of Noah, where there was so much wickedness going on, but nobody even noticed. They were eating and drinking and marrying as if nothing was wrong, and God was getting ready to judge the earth, and he judged the earth through a flood. Then judgment came upon Christ in the cross, and now judgment is, is literally going to come when it, it all sifts out to see what we chose to believe if we took the cross seriously, and then how we lived our lives in response to what he made available to us as a church in this hour when the Holy Spirit is preparing us for our bridegroom. And so the foolish didn't have that history with him. They didn't have that oil. And they ran to the ones with wisdom and they were saying, give me what you have, give me what you have. And I think of it like right now what we're going through with COVID-19 and um, the craziness that we see of just a lack of toilet paper, for instance. And there's this scurrying about in this panic that I didn't store up, I didn't have enough, and now we're knocking on each other's door saying, can, can I have some of your toilet paper or whatever it is? And, 
And the ones who were wise and who had stored up, they might have one or two rolls extra, but often what I think we're hearing is, I can't give you mine or else I won't have enough to get me through the rest of this season. And this is like coming to my mind as I'm studying the scriptures today and Jesus says the kingdom of heaven will be like that. It's a funny picture for a very serious thing. That the church who believes in Jesus and loves in Jesus will be split between the foolish and the wise. It's not a matter of who's saved or not. They're all saved. But the foolish will be running to the wise saying, wait, I need some of your oil. And, and as I look at the landscape of church and how we've been doing church in the Western world and probably throughout the rest of the world and what we can fall into so easily is that we show up on Sunday and we get a sermon and we get a worship service that makes us feel good, inspires us, makes us feel encouraged, and then we go home. But what are we doing in that? We are actually living off of the oil of someone else. We're living off of the oil that that worship leader collected that enabled them to be able to lead you into worship. We're living off of the oil of of that pastor or that teacher who preached to us out of the hours that they spent studying to understand the word of God to be able to explain it in in a passionate way. And and maybe we're not even reading our Bibles. We're not even worshiping on our own one-on-one with Jesus throughout the week. We're just coming to church week after week and getting Um, a little bit of oil from someone else so that we can keep our lamp burning just enough to get through the next week. But Jesus says that's foolish. That's foolish because when I'm about to return, it's going to get so dark. And you're not going to have that same system that you may have had before where you could go glean off of somebody else. And I feel like we feel that right now with the isolation and the separation with COVID-19 and shelter in place. We feel that, ah, you know, and we're not able to go take someone else's oil right now. But Jesus is saying, hey, I'm doing you a favor. I'm helping you shake up a little bit where you're at to self-evaluate how I'm doing my Christianity. How am I developing this bridal love for my bridegroom king who is coming back? And if I'm not ready in that darkest hour of tribulation, in that darkest hour of trial, in that darkest hour of the earth, the midnight hour, if I have not learned how to do this on my own, how to get into the secret place, how to read my word, how to worship him one-on-one, out of utter silence, come into a place of worship and, and be led to tears by the power of the Holy Spirit because I'm, I'm looking at my bridegroom, I'm in love with him, and I'm not depending on the loud music, the lights, the leadership of someone else. I've developed this in the secret place my, myself. I can do it all by myself. If I haven't developed that, when the midnight hour comes and, and the systems are shaken up and the drought hits and the church is tested and persecuted and we're all in our different areas and I have not developed oil in my lamp, I'm going to be scurrying about asking someone to help me with their oil and they're going to be saying, I can't, I can't give it to you. You have to go get it for yourself. You have to go buy it for yourself because this is now the hour where he's coming and you have to know what to look for. You have to know how to be steadfast. You have to know how to persevere. You have to know how to have fire in your heart, even in the trial and the tribulation, even in the isolation and the moments of loneliness. You need to learn to let him heal that loneliness By the power of the Holy Spirit, he's helping us prepare for that time. And this is what it means right now. He says, watch therefore and pray because you don't know the day or the hour. And so I just want to urge you, urge us as the church right now to say, I'm I'm aware of what time it is. And even if the midnight hour is just now approaching and the, 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 the time, you know, on the clock is ticking closer and closer to that dark hour, I'm going to take heed and remember what the kingdom of heaven will look like before he comes back. And I'm going to choose today. I'm not going to be the foolish one. I'm going to be wise. And I'm going to develop my own oil now, even in the luxury of the church where I can get on YouTube and watch hundreds of sermons a day and I can listen to someone else's worship and just bask in it. I'm still going to be faithful to turn it off and to, to talk with him about his word, to get into it with him myself, to wrestle with him to talk with him, to ask him to explain it to me. I want the Holy Spirit to talk to me the same way he does 
to the leaders that I admire out there who are feeding me. Because in the midnight hour, when he returns, if you don't have oil in your lamp, you're not going to have time to go buy it. Cultivate it now. And he says, this is what the wise one will look like. They're all saved. It's the church. But when I come back, there's going to be a natural sifting out. And the ones who really love me are the ones I'm going to take into the wedding chamber. I'm, he's coming for a bride who has intimacy with him, who knows him, who loves him. He's not coming for a half-hearted bride who never really got to know him herself but wants to bask in the riches of what it means to be married to him. He says, no, I'm coming for the one who loves me. And when I come back, she'll be ready and she'll know and she'll jump into position and she will have a history with me. So in that darkest time of the earth, she'll be shining bright. She'll be shining in the earth. And even others in the church will come and ask, how did you get that? Give it to me. And it's all going to be from the history and what time and what money and what life was invested. The cost of knowing Christ was paid long before that midnight hour. And it was that cost that purchased the history of the oil of the Holy Spirit in her life that causes her to shine and burn when he comes back. And so I just want to urge you, get into your word, develop, let this time of, of um, shelter in place be, be a place where you say, I'm going to get on my face and I want to know you, Jesus. I want to start knowing you for myself. I, I will be fed by the leaders around me and the pastors that feed me, but I'm not going to live off their oil. I'm going to get oil of my own. And when the darkness comes upon my own personal life and trial or upon the whole earth, because it's time for him to come back, I'm going to have my own oil. And I'm going to be burning bright right next to the ones I admire. And I'm not going to be looking to them to feed me um, what they don't have in that moment to give me because it was something they had to buy themselves. Okay? So, Jesus, I just pray for a blessing upon the church, a, a blessing upon anyone who watches this, that the oil in their life will grow and increase. And I pray, God, that our hearts will burn bright for you, not just a, a vibrancy of righteousness, but a vibrancy of love, passionate love, like a bride awaiting the day of her wedding, God, that that romance and that fire and that love for Jesus would burn so bright in the church that we would remember who we are waiting for and we would have passion for him that far outweighs any passion or joy of this world. That you, Jesus, would be the joy of our heart, the desire of our heart, and the passion we, we hold on to and look for. In Jesus' name, amen.